Well, let me ask, are there any outstanding questions, comments or challenges about anything we've said so far? Nope, none at all. We will begin by 4 o'clock, Alan. You're all right. We'll open the talk anymore. <laughs> 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 No? You're all clear on this idea that behaviour isn't a disorder in itself. We, we, don't, we don't medicate behaviour, we medicate disorders, and the, as the disorder improves, people's behaviour might improve, mm -hmm. but we don't directly medicate behaviour. Yeah, you're all clear with that? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Um, well, I have a, a last question for you, really, because, uh, well, I should have a couple of questions. Uh, one that I always ask is this. Am I still keeping your interest? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, and is this information likely to be useful to you? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Right. Um, I was just looking at this list. We're not going to get through everything. Um, I thought as we, we did it, it was a bit ambitious, but we're certainly not. But I'm going to skim through some of them, so at least we'll, we'll, start, we'll look a bit at them. I want to do that now. Um, but I'm only going to spend about 10 minutes on it and just throw some little ideas out because mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that we need to do is part of the contract, of course, really. But um, the, the dementia and limbic system, we, we haven't talked a little bit about that. Was that in no, that limbic system stuff? That, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's all about, as people... Yeah, it's exactly uh, that. As people become increasingly demented, they lose the higher functions. So we... We try to work with the, the bits of the brain that are working. And the limbic system is always working if they're alive. So that's why we, we, we do that stuff. Early stages, you know, I mean, Terry Pratchett's got dementia, he's still writing books. And, and so in the early stages, fair enough. But as it gets more advanced, um, we go more and more towards the, the limbic system stuff. Substances and dual diagnosis. I would love to spend more time on that. For the reasons we said earlier about people falling through the net. Mm -hmm. I think the only useful thing to say, because we haven't got time to do a whole course on it, is that if you think about stress and vulnerability, you don't have to get hung up on this difference between mental disorder and substance misuse. All you have, if you think about stress and vulnerability, is somebody who is vulnerable to anxiety, depression and psychosis because of these factors, one of which is biology, and that would be the substance, but you've also got social and cultural and environment and how we think about it and all of that. And if you look at what happens, this, this to me is the important bit. If you look at what happens on a day-to-day -day level in uh, a substance misuse unit, and then you look at what happens on a day-to-day -day level in a mental health unit, you'll find that it's identical. The same staff are doing, or different staff are doing the same things. There are differences between what we call general mental health and substance misuse. But those differences don't appear at the bottom level. They only appear as you get more and more specialists until you've got a specialist psychiatrist here doing that and a specialist psychiatrist here doing that. And they're different. But actually everybody else is doing pretty much the same stuff. Does that make sense? So you don't need to get hung up about the difference between clients and services when actually the only specialization happens at that very highly qualified level. All the rest of us, we're just treating people like people. And that's largely it. Mm -hmm. So, according to stress and vulnerability, whether you've got someone with a drug use problem, or you've got somebody with an alcohol issue, or you've got somebody who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, or just a bog standard anxiety state like agoraphobia that's scared of going outside. You're still looking at these five things and you're still trying to decrease vulnerability and help them manage stress. It's the same thing. Beyond that, I, without doing a proper full course on, on dual diagnosis, there's not much more I can say really. But does that give you at least the feel that you don't have to worry about the difference? Because for most of us, there is not. It's just people and we do what we do with them. You all alright with that? Alright, cool. You can see I'm just going down the list, but at least I'll find we'll do that in a minute. Chemical kosh, who was that? We talked about chemical mm -hmm. kosh. Over. Right, the over-medication thing. Still on stress and vulnerability. This is why it's such a good model to get in your head, because it works for everything. If you have, let's say that you've got an anxiety state, so you're very anxious and agitated and all of that, and you're very restless, and you might lash out and all of that sort of stuff. 
We would need to treat that anxiety because that anxiety, apart from distressing you, is also possibly what's causing the problem. We'll do it with biology, we'll do it with a sedative. If we over-sedate you, if we give you too much, then that creates a problem in terms of you being able to think, you won't be able to, and, uh, to join in socially, you may not be able to develop in certain ways, and we've actually created a massive problem for you as well. But the intention might well be rather nice. The intention is simply to take the edge off the anxiety. Problem is, there are some people who will deliberately over meditate because it's easier. The only thing I can say about that is if you believe that someone is deliberately over meditated, report them. Because it's a gift. But understand that a lot of people get over medicated and it's not because anyone wants to be abusive, it's because you generally, genuinely don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's a question to be asked about why is this happening. You may not be the person to ask it, you may never be able to get the answer to that. If you bother, report it. Because nobody should be over medicated in this moment. Not if we can help it. You okay with that? Again, it's not something I can say a lot on, but it's not acceptable unless there's no alternative. But if there's no alternative, whoever's doing it will be able to say why there's no alternative. You just report it. Trauma. Have you started? I like stories. This one goes back a bit. I'm, uh, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on anything outside of what I do myself, but I'm probably not an expert in that either. But I, <laughs> Well, you know, pretentious to say you're an expert in anything, isn't it? Um, but I, I have a real interest in history, and I have a particular interest in military history. So I'm going to tell you about the First World War. <laughs> Not vegetarian, isn't it? Remember this. Remember this model. The more stressed you are, the more symptoms you get. Right, First World War, very, very quickly. I'm not going to spend a long time on this because you would go to sleep because not everybody's interested in that, but I am. I'm going to show you again how rubbish I am at drawing stuff. This time I'm drawing a map of France. There you go, that's a map of France. <laughs> <laughs> and this here, that's the south coast of England. And this isn't. This is the Somme River. Actually, it sort of goes on the that way, but no, it's a river in France called the Somme. Germans invade France, like that, uh, and they do really well, and they take up loads and loads of French territory. We send over the British Expeditionary Force, together with the, the French, and we, uh, we try and stop the Germans, and we end up with a race to the coast, and it's a race across, across France with everybody building trenches, until eventually you get your little bit of that, your little bit of the Somme, you've got the trenches all around the plains of the Somme, um, where people were, were stuck for, for years. So that's the bit you already know. Something else you already know, watch Shell Shock. Post traumatic stress disorder, what do you call it? Sorry, go on. Shocked by the shells. Shocked by the shells, <laughs> yeah, okay. It, there were three elements to Shell Shock, or three different types of Shell Shock. One was what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder, or you might want to call it battle fatigue, but there's all sorts of names for it, depending basically on which country is naming it, because different armies have different names for it. Um, well, this is where we're going. But the shell shock itself is a reaction to the trauma. Another one was a very odd neurological disorder, and you may see there was a hospital called Craig Lockhart near Edinburgh. Yeah, it really, was more than just a tremor, it was like really wild movements. And there's, there's a, 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 a little piece of film of this, this guy walking down a corridor, and his arms and legs are going everywhere, and he's trying to walk, and he can't. And we still don't know why that happened. But it's funny, you can actually divide it into thirds, and about a third of cases of shell shock were this very odd neurological disorder where people couldn't control their movements. And then the third aspect of shell shock was what we were talking about earlier when we talked about psychosis. Hallucinations, delusions, and thought disorders. They all got lumped together as shell shock at the time, but it was caused by stress and trauma. And the real evidence for that is the Allies were trying to push the Germans out of France. Yeah? Make sense? So they always saw their trenches as temporary structures, so it was sandbags and duck boards. The Germans 
Well, actually, they don't quite like to get all of France, but if that was all we got, that would do. So what they did, apart from a few big battles around a place called Verdun and a few other places, um, they, they had much more permanent trenches. But they preserved the trenches either side of this particular stretch of the Somme. And you can go and you can see the duck boards and sandbags, which were surrounded by rats and the decomposing corpses of your mates if you were in the, in the trench, on the Allied side. And then you can go down and see the concrete bunkers with the grand pianos and the double beds and the, um, and the drinks cabinets and things in the German side. It was significantly deeper and significantly better structure. Which, which trench, if you're getting shelled, which trench would you like to be in? You'd be like, the German side, wouldn't you? <laughs> Guess which side had the most shell shock? The British side. Because they were more vulnerable, they were more scared, and they were less safe. I think that's really interesting. But what it does demonstrate, because these lads that were in the trenches, they weren't biologically bad people. They'd all pass, okay, I'm sure that the, um, the medical examination to join up in 1914-15 wouldn't have been brilliant. <coughs> but they weren't people who were taken straight out of the lunatic asylum and put into the front line. These were ostensibly psychologically healthy people who ended up matters of oxyprox because of trauma. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we go back to stress and vulnerability, it's all sort of obvious, isn't it, really? We know stress creates anxiety. We know how that stress creates depression. Uh, and that anxiety moves to depression when you heal up. And that's easy to see. But, you know, I guess you've all got that. But once you stop banging your head against a brick wall, you get depressed. Psychosis, I think that First World War thing is about as good an illustration as we can get of the fact that psychosis is also stress related. It's all trauma. But it's not just trauma. The difference is that because different people have different levels of vulnerability, what might seem incredibly traumatic for your service user up here mm -hmm. will look like nothing at all to you if you can mm -hmm. But it's enough to overwhelm them. It's all trauma. But it's not just trauma. You've got all this other stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? Because again, it's one of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the reasons why so many of us reject the traditional medical model is because it says that trauma doesn't matter. Biology is everything. And biology does matter, but it's only part of it. <laughs> What's a personality disorder? That's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me put it another way. What's a personality? <laughs> okay, whoever told you that didn't understand. No, it was a training. Okay. Whoever told you that didn't understand. I don't care how many letters they had after the name, they didn't understand. It's mm -hmm. not a copy. What's a personality though? Yes. Yes. Traits. traits. Mm -hmm. Right. You have certain traits, don't you? There are certain things about you that make you who you are. Mm -hmm. They have been as they are, in most cases for all of your life, and certainly since you hit for, for women early 20s and for men late 20s. And there are certain aspects of your personality that are fixed. Mm -hmm. And I can't change them, can I? Mm. So, for example, if you were walking up the street on pension day and you see some little old lady come out of the post office and a couple of likely lads go and, uh, and, and knock it to the ground and pinch your pension and then one of them stamps on her head just for fun, because he can. And she's lying there in a pool of blood as they run away. Would you cross the road and just ignore her? Right, because your personality won't let you do that. That's one of your traits. Now, here's a question. What would I have to do to change you into the sort of person that would leave her? Yeah. Well, right, but how do I do that? How do I change you? Um, well, I could do, but that's not going to change who you are. That would just be still you, but drugged up. But you'd still be you. Right, how do I do that? Well, I think you have to be 
Well, I don't think you can. But fortunately, that's not the task. If you got depressed, and you ended up on a ward that I was working on, you wouldn't expect me to change who you are. You'd want me to treat the depression, would you? Mm -hmm. How is that any different to somebody with a sort of personality that we don't like? Yeah, yeah, and, and you are, but my argument is, see, what people say is you can't treat personality disorder. Yeah? Personality disorder is just what we call a personality that isn't socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. In the same way that we said about other mental disorders, it's just not acceptable. Borderline personality disorder, um, it's people who have difficulty because of uh, overwhelming trauma, usually uh, in those formative years, usually as they're growing up. Uh, it changes the way that uh, people respond to trauma and to stress and the way that they manage their emotions. Mm -hmm. But my job as a nurse in mental health is not to treat someone's personality. My job is to help them deal with anxiety, depression and psychosis. Isn't it? <coughs> if their personality makes them more vulnerable than other people to anxiety, depression and psychosis, then surely the job is to work more with them, not less. Does that make sense? Yeah. What we do, though, is we say, oh, you can't treat personality, but that's not the task. The mm -hmm. task is to treat anxiety, depression, and psychosis. Mm -hmm. You get that? Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting document. If you come up against people who say, we can't work with your client because they have a personality disorder, there is a document. It was published in 2002 by the Department of Health. It's called Personality Disorder, Not a Diagnosis of Exclusion. Basically makes it clear that people have are a professional duty to work with people with personality disorders on the symptoms they present. What they can't do is change the personality, but that's not what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Help with the anxiety, depression, and psychosis. Where did, where did personality disorder come from? Yeah, about that oh, well, it's difficult to pinpoint that. The use of the term personality disorder, that's probably 1930s, 1940s. But prior to that, we had uh, moral defective. And then before that, you're just looking at general terms for insane. Well, Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> now, I said at the start of the day, we have a legacy in mental health services, and the legacy isn't always very nice. That's the legacy of personality disorder, but that doesn't mean that we will diagnose it depending on how much money you've got. That's not the legacy that we have down to it. But what we have got is this idea about what is and is not socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that's all personality disorder means. It's do we like you? Mm -hmm. Now, I think it was, was you, Tanya, that said that somebody had told you that it's a cop out diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's a cop out diagnosis if people don't understand the criteria for personality disorder. And most people don't. In fairness, most people will say, oh, yes, it's personality disorder, and I play this game with them. Mm -hmm. If they say it's personality disorder, ask them which one. And then, if they're able to tell you which one, say, well, what are the criteria for that? Right, that's just not true. The one you're on about, borderline personality disorder, just to show you how silly that is. And I'm not going to go at you, but I don't want you to be fooled by people who say, oh yeah, it's just meaningless. It's not. There are nine criteria for borderline. But you need any five of the nine. That's not not knowing what to do with someone, or not knowing where to put them. That's very precise, isn't it? It's so precise, there are only 234 ways to get a combination that will give you borderline personality disorder, which isn't actually all that precise. But we're still looking definitely at these things on a really interesting bit for you, Matt, is um, if you look at the way that people respond to trauma, particularly when they're kids, actually, no, I can't go there because it'll take too long. Um, those of you who've either done or are coming on the self-harm course, you'll get that in more detail. I need to ask you to, to trust it, though. Um, these are the responses to trauma. 
uh, and actually one of the um, one of the campaigns that's running at the moment in the uh, psychiatric community is to change this and call it DESNOS, which stands for Disorder of Extreme Stress, not otherwise specified. Mm -hmm. Because actually it's all it's all related to overwhelming stress and trauma. Um, I have witted far too much, so I'm going to give you the personality disorder handout with a little question for you to talk to. And it's this. Some people say it is very, very appropriate for us in mental health services to be interested in personality and personality disorder. Other people say, well, the job isn't to treat the personality, so why do we care? Your task as a little group on your table is to say why it's a good idea to concern ourselves with PD and why it isn't. Right, very quickly then. Why might it be appropriate, apart from this group, because I told you, why might it be appropriate for psychiatrists to be interested in personality and personality disorder? Because <laughs> they're going to keep up on medication. Well, to an extent, yeah, they're going to know what the likelihoods are. Um, the thing about diagnosis is, is you can argue there's only really two purposes to diagnosis. One is to predict outcome, so we can have an idea what's going to happen. And the other one is to inform treatment, so we know what to do about it. And if a diagnosis does one or preferably both of those two things, it's a valid diagnosis. Does personality diagnosis let you know roughly what's going to happen? So I think it does. I think if I know that my client has these problems, I can predict what will happen if I say, well, I don't like you very much. I know what will happen. If I find that somebody is um, concerned about their own mortality, there are some people where they're concerned about their own mortality, and quite frankly, I'll sit them down and I'll say, look, everybody dies, but you're not dead yet, start living your life. But I'm not going to say that to somebody who's got concrete black and white thinking issues. So yeah, it does. I can predict what will happen if I do this, that, and the other because of the diagnosis. Does that make sense? Does it inform treatment? Does it tell me what to do? Yeah, it does. The problem with personality disorder, this is really important to get this in your head. The problem with personality disorder is not that it doesn't work as a diagnosis, because it does. The problem is actually going back to what you said earlier. So many people think it's just a dust thing. So it's the name we give people when we don't like them very much. And I'm ashamed to say that an awful lot of my colleagues use it exactly like that. But they don't understand either. Actually, it's this. And it's, it's much more precise than that. But if you use it right, it will tell you an awful lot that you can use to help the person you work with. That's why I say this again. Somebody says it's personality disorder, ask them which one. And then look at the criteria are, right, because you can be surprised how many can't answer it. And it's for me. But more than that, if they know they're going to be asked, we'll bloody well find out. Mm -hmm. So next time they come, they will have done that research and they will know. So ask them. They can find out. Anyway. Does that make sense? That's why it's, it's appropriate. Why is it inappropriate? <laughs> it's the end of a long day, isn't it? Okay, look, they're basically trained to, to, to do the physical things. Yeah? Rather than... Uh, <coughs> mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I mean, you don't write lines that um, it would be a bit like saying that if I'm a poet, I need to know all about oil painting. No, I don't. Because I don't do oil paint. I, I write words down. And it's a little bit like that, that you can argue that you don't need to know someone's personality to recognize anxiety, depression, and psychosis. Mm -hmm. I still think, on balance, this is my own personal view, it's worth understanding personality because it can predict outcome and it can inform treatment. But we've got to use it for what it is and not get carried away. The problem is it ends up with a value judgment. And then you get people being written off, and people say, oh, we can't treat personality, so we're not going to bother. And then it's a problem. But if it's used properly, it's very useful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so yeah, I'm <laughs> Now, what's interesting is I knew nothing about your person. I just knew the diagnosis. Because I knew the diagnosis, I listed them and I knew about that. That's the value of a diagnosis. You all right with that? Yeah. Okay, good. Right. What was the CBT? Um, oh, now then. <laughs> CBT is it CBT stuff? Uh, well, now mindfulness is more DBT than CBT. Uh, problem is, sorry, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. DBT is dialectic behavioral therapy. And the reason why that's there, there's black and white thinking. It's either all good or it's all bad. They're two opposites. That's the dialectic. It's either this or it's that. Dialectical behavior therapy helps people to see that actually there might be something in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it also manages that because the um, the black and white thinking all good and all bad is also about me being all good and all bad if I'm the person with that diagnosis. So, if I accept that I was mistaken when I thought it was all good or all bad, then I have to accept that I'm not right all the time. And if I'm not right all the time, I must be wrong all the time. And if I'm wrong all the time, I must be a bad person because I can't be a good person because good people are right all the time. And... One of the problems that we have for years with people with this sort of way of thinking, with that black and white concrete thinking, is the moment you try to make any sort of change, you scare the hell out of them because the self-esteem goes right through the boots. And more than that, they're aware that you're aware, and then that means that they think that you're going to abandon them because they're not wonderful people, and if they're not wonderful, they must be horrible. And if they're horrible, why would you want to work with them? And it, it gets really difficult to do any work. So DBT... Dialectical behaviour therapy manages the dialectic. It gives people ways to understand that it's okay. Nobody knew anything when they were first born in one of the tactics. People learn stuff throughout their lives, starting with nothing, and they learn at different rates. And it doesn't matter how long it takes you to learn it. What matters is you learn it. But it's still, it's, it's a process that takes a lot of managing. That's is that just talking to the person? There's all sorts of bits. That, the the behaviour part of it, is that you're going to do stuff as well. That's like the mindfulness. Uh, I think, Alex, did you mention mindfulness? Somebody did. Mm -hmm. Might have been you. Somebody mentioned mindfulness anyway. Mm -hmm. right. And, and that's, that's a way of helping... That's a way of helping people... Uh, it's a way of helping people to manage how they feel. Uh, and mindfulness is dead easy. If I start to get overwhelmed with my anxiety, I will think about something to keep me grounded. Um, also, there's a thing called dissociation, which I'm not going to even attempt to define for you today. Uh, but it helps people to avoid that as well. And it's stuff like, this is just in my head, but I might be saying, okay, well, I'm in this training room, it's quite warm, and it's the end of a long day, and I can't the end of a long day, it's going to be warm, because there's, well, it's 13 people plus me, that's 14 people in this fairly little room, windows don't open as far as I can tell, and I think the heating's been on all day as well, which is why... Oh, yeah. But never mind. It's quite a nice room. Actually. There's some lovely pictures of like, Scottish castles and rocks and stuff like that, which I suppose is what you'd expect in Glasgow. But they're very nice. They're maybe a little bit smart. They have to be a little bit bigger. But they work quite well with this lighting as well. This lighting isn't quite the same as it was earlier. And I'm just being aware of everything. <laughs> and that mindfulness, it's actually it's, it's from Zen Buddhism, uh, but it's a technique that allows you to step outside yourself so you become an observer. And we have, well, I would say if we're going to have time to do evaluations and stuff, no more than 20 minutes left. And I'm not going to make you do an exercise at this this point in the day, because that would be just too cruel, and you can you can flog it then, that's can kind of. um, What I do want to talk to you about, though, is recovery. Because I think if you work in mental health services, in any capacity, and you're not doing recovery, with the exception of the dementias, where... We don't know enough to do recovery yet. Maybe one day we will, but we don't yet. But in any of the other services, if you're not doing recovery, my argument is, well, what are you doing? And why are you working in mental health services? Does that make sense? Because we should all be in recovery. But in order for that to make any sense, we need to know what recovery means. And I say there are three types of recovery. I'll give you a clue. One of them is medical recovery. And that means absence of symptoms. So if, for example, I hear your voices and I get medical recovery, the voices have gone. There's two others. What do you reckon they are? Two other types of recovery. Mm -hmm. Well, they're all, they're all full-blown recovery. They're just different types of recovery. 
That's medical recovery. Symptoms we've got. Managing symptoms. Right. Okay, so you've got the symptoms. At a sociable level. Right. You've actually, in that, you've put in two types. The other two, you've got both of them. Well, it's fine. It's cool. <laughs> like it. That's, see, that's you thinking through the links. And that's what I was hoping to get you all to, is that you can see. Remember I said at the start, give you lots of jigsaw pieces, but we'll mm -hmm. end up with a broad picture. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is exactly that, to get, so you can say it all fits. Social recovery, you've still got the symptoms, but you've got a valued place in your society. You've got a social role. Remember the people in, in South India? Don't care if you hear the voices getting that field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got a social role. You have a place in your society. And the other one is psychological recovery. You've got the symptoms, but they don't bother you. You don't care. A lot of us would argue that actually you only need any two of the three, and it doesn't matter which two. So what we're saying is you can have recovery if you don't care about your symptoms and you've got a role in society, even if you've still got the symptoms. How do you feel about that? I remember doing that at the test of a closely personality disorders and it, 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 there was one of the disorders that, that basically applied to very successful people and they would be disassociated themselves with uh, other people's emotions. Yeah. And, and they were really, really good business people and yeah. being bosses and things like that. And they didn't really have the, the sympathy that like you're, you're having to Now you're talking about what we used to call psychopathy. Yeah, I call yeah, it yeah. social personality yeah. disorder. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that there are a number of, of um, a number of politicians I could think of who I am absolutely certain. Uh, no, no, I'm not kidding. I am absolutely certain they are psychopaths. I've gone down for a minute. Uh, because if you look at their behaviour and their inability to relate to those people at the bottom of the pile and all of that, to the well, sorry? Um, you may think so, I couldn't possibly comment. And I'm not, I'm not going to name who I think, but there are a number of, of politicians that I have no doubt at all are psychopaths. A number of business leaders as well. I mean, I think most politicians are psychopaths. They don't really actually have any empathy with the people. They may say they do, but the reality is they don't. Yeah, um, I don't know. The reason that's so bloody important to say at least once to everybody in mental health care is because if you are focusing only on medical recovery, you'll probably never get it. And particularly when you're looking at psychosis. Um, I'm going to just give you a couple of little references. There's a, first of all, there's a guy called David James who wrote a book uh, which you can still occasionally see on sites like Amazon where it's out of print. Uh, he wrote it in the 70s. The title is quite long-winded. It's The Origins of Consciousness and the Decline of the Bicameral Mind. But what he says, essentially, is that up until recently, as we evolved as a species, everybody was a voice hearer. Uh, and the reason he says that is because if you look at ancient texts, and it, it doesn't matter what the ancient text is, from uh, the, the Bible to I Ching to the Bhagavad Gita uh, to the Greek and Norse classic, classics to the Roman classics, nobody has an idea of their own. Everybody is told what to do by the gods. And if you think about the classics, it's always the case. The gods tell them what to do. They don't have ideas. They don't notice that. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, even if you look at the, the, the film version of Jason and the Argonauts, that everybody's seen at least 400 times over, you know, over Christmas and Easter and all of that. But Jason never has any ideas. The, the goddess of the Athena, isn't it? That you know, tells, him, tells him what to do all the time. James reckons that that's because we all thought as auditory hallucination. So, what we have then is this idea that we all used to be voice hearers. Current evolutionary change is that about 15% of the population are still voice hearers, and if you're aiming to get rid of that, you never will. It's really important to get the right type of recovery. Have you heard of the Pygmalion in the classroom experiment? Yeah. This is great. This is, remember I said very early on, you're the most important people in the care team. Well, this is the evidence for why. You see, I'm now pulling the jigsaw back together again. Good way to do that, isn't it? You see what I did there? <laughs> Jacobson and Rosenthal. 
in, in Oak School, which is uh, what we would call um, an upper primary school or a junior school, but it's in America. Uh, and they did this research where basically the researcher comes in and speaks to the head teacher, whose name happened to be Kathleen. And I'm a researcher and I have a crack with you, and I get you to talk to two of your teachers who are called, oh God, I've got to do this now, I'm Sally, Tanya. Right. You call them into your office. Kathleen, and you say, we have done this research looking at the children that come out of this school and as they go right through their school careers and then go on to university, the ones that do, the college can make it to college, go on to college, uh, and we've seen who gets the best college degrees of all the children that have been through in this school. And we've identified that far and away, the most successful children from this school have been in your classes. So you must be the best teacher in the school. That's nice, isn't it? <laughs> Makes you feel all nice and warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it? <laughs> so, says Kathleen, we are going to capitalise on this. You're really good teachers. We're going to give you the best kids. That seems the obvious thing to do. So we are going to give you the brightest and the best children for you to work on for a year. And we expect really good things. We're going to measure it at the end of the year and see how good these kids do as they go up to, I don't know, senior high or whatever you have, I don't understand the American school system, but as they move on. We're also going to give you the less able children as well. We'll give you the ones that really aren't very good at what they do, the kids that struggle a lot, and that we don't really expect to be very successful anyway. But we have to give you the mix because otherwise it's too obvious. It's really important. We'll tell you which is which, but it's really important that you don't let on to anybody. That's just for you to know. And don't mention it to a soul, especially not the children. Because if you do, we'll go on and tell them others and we'll be held to this. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. So that's what they do. You get these really bright kids and you get these really academic underachievers. Um, and you do your teaching and a year later, you come back. But this time, Kathleen, you're not in the office on your own. You're in the office with me. I'm the researcher. And you bring them in. I say, hello, my name's Stuart. I'm a researcher. You didn't know there was a researcher, did you? Well, you do now. But I'm really interested in what the results that we've got. But would you like to just tell me, how did you do with the children in your classes? And Tanya and Sally, Sally, say, well, it was exactly as we thought. I mean, these bright kids, they were a joy to teach. They were an absolute pleasure. And the results we got from these children... It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've been a teacher for 30 years. I've never seen anything like this. These children, they are gifted. Thank you so much for giving me these kids. I mean, a couple of them did have problems at the start of the year. But clearly, they were such, you know, such excellent children. It was like they were having problems at home or something like that. And we just threw that little bit of extra support to get them over that hurdle. And they've all done brilliantly. What about the kids who weren't so good? Oh, well... Sort of as expected, they didn't do too well, but we didn't think that they would anyway. Um, there were a couple that would, I think at the start of the year, they must have been copying, um, because they got, well, they got results that really we expected from the high flyers, not from them. But we, we dealt with that, we stopped that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, well, you didn't expect us to do well with them anyway, and, and I'm sure you won't be surprised at the results that they haven't done very well. But there you go. And the researcher says, um, that's really interesting because um, there were no gifted children and there were no stupid children and um, we just pulled these names randomly out of a hat. But isn't it interesting how well you did with the children you thought were gifted? And he said, well, that's because we must be such good teachers. And he said, well, actually, we pulled your names out of our hat as well. Ah. <laughs> Probably true. You can look it up online. <laughs> Jacobson and Rosen, Jacobson and Rosenthal, Oak School, Pygmalion in the Classroom, look it up online. Mm -hmm. It's really, really profound, because what it is, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. These were ordinary teachers with ordinary children. The only people who knew about the expectation were the teachers themselves. Parents didn't know, children didn't know, nobody knew, but the, the teachers had beliefs. Those beliefs affected everything they did, and they set up a chain of experience. This is why you couldn't do it now, because, you know, there's, what, 40 kids whose academic careers were ruined 
mm-hmm. by two teachers who just got the wrong idea of them. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, well, yeah, but it's really important because this happens all the time in schools where you will get into your all event stories. It might have been you yourself, some mm-hmm. particular teacher wrote you off very early on in the school year and it took you three years to recover if you ever did because of the power of self-fulfilling prophecy. Now it gets really interesting for us. There's a guy called David Rosenham. David Rosenham did some research in the 90s about the pseudo-patient. So you come across that? Mm-hmm. Pseudo-patient research. Brilliant. We're all leading to one common place by the end of this. But Rosenham, again in America, he, uh, he trained some actors. And he trained actors to present with serious mental disorders and get themselves admitted to psychiatric hospitals. They all presented in exactly the same way and they all got in. And then the instruction was stop being ill. The moment you're admitted, drop the act and be yourself. And get out as soon as you can. Because in America the system's a bit different. Uh, it's quite hard getting out of psychiatric hospitals in America. So they were there for months. <coughs> and they were there for months because once they'd been admitted, everything that they did was seen as part of a mental illness. Everything. There was one guy, he, um, he was bored. So he used to walk up and down the corridors because he was bored in this psychiatric hospital. And there's actually, it's quoted in the notes, pathological walking behaviour. Because we see what we expect to see. But quite frankly, you might as well just say pathological pie eating. <laughs> we see what we expect to see. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's all about expectation. Mm-hmm. You see that? Yeah. So. Just to tie this in, the very last thing, remember, who's the most important person in the care team? It's you, love. We have a thing called therapeutic optimism. Depend on your name. Leslie. Leslie, that's 50 quid. <laughs> well, put it in your pocket, then. You haven't really put it in your pocket. Why hasn't she put that 50 quid properly in her pocket? It's not it's not really Here it is. The best you can see is she doesn't believe it's there. Yeah? If you don't believe something is there, you're not going to work very hard to get it. The only reason she put her hand out at all is because of that social pressure of being in a room and if you you came a public performance and you had to comply. But actually, normally, she would have said, don't be really stupid, it's not there and I'm not trying. Because people don't try to get what they can, what they don't believe is possible. If you don't believe recovery is possible for your service users, you will transmit that to them in exactly the same way that the teachers did at all school. You'll also end up changing your own behaviour in exactly the same way that the American psychiatrists and nurses did in Rosalind's pseudo-patient experiment. The only antidote to that is what we call therapeutic optimism. If you believe that there is a chance that that person will recover, they are much more likely to take the 50 quid than if you don't think it's possible. Because if you don't think it's possible, you won't work for it and neither will. Who's the most important person in the care team? Sheila!